Um, so we'll talk a little bit. Trick to this? Oh, that one's better. Ah, yeah. oh, thanks very much. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about what next generation disease taxonomy might look like in critical illness. And the, the topic and the content is um, at times a little bit diffuse and even opaque. So I, I will try to sort of go through it in a way that hopefully makes it clearer. But we're really sort of, it's, it's a paradigm change for clinicians to really think a little bit about how we actually approach the patient in front of us, how we diagnose them, and then obviously how we prognosticate and provide specific therapies. So I'm going to propose in this hypothesis um, based talk, that maybe the current syndromic or clinical classification of critical illness is no longer doing justice to the patients that we take care of in our intensive care unit, the cardiac intensive care unit, and throughout the hospitals, um, uh, 52 bedded ICUs, I guess. Um, and I'm going to propose instead that maybe thinking about critical illness instead as a host response paradigm and focusing less on the downstream clinical manifestations of disease, but rather the upstream or sort of intermediate mechanistic mediators of what caused those downstream responses may better help us align patients with therapies on the quest towards precision medicine. And obviously, given the content, we'll focus predominantly on cardiogenic shock and MI-related heart failure, but we'll talk a lot about uh, some of the uh, parallels to other critical illnesses along the way. So very briefly, why are we talking about all this? Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the uh, mortality over the past 10, 15 years or so. Uh, for cardiogenic shock, as you can see, it's a completely flat line, stagnant at about 30%. This is a registry of high-volume centers. It's a cath center. These are mostly MI-related cardiogenic shock. The reality is a lot of the cardiogenic shock we see actually faces more of a 40 to 50% mortality, even in the current era. And this has also been true in, in sepsis as well, where mortality really has only improved in the last few years, I would say, because of process-related care patterns, but certainly not because of the therapies and the numerous, numerous trials that have been applied to these patients. In cardiogenic shock, it's not for lack of trying either. We've applied a number of therapies, device-based approaches that have tried to restore the hemodynamic insult that initially causes the host to have a response, but none of those therapies have really led to a meaningful improvement in outcomes. And to many of us, this suggests that maybe we're intervening too late. And although the problem starts out as an initial cardiac insult, it then spirals into a number of pathways that are actually what mediates the outcome and what actually affects whether the patient survives or not. Those pathways vary considerably from patient to patient. And in that context, it's very difficult to then sort of apply contemporary molecular-based therapeutics when you're really using a very old classification system for defining the initial insult and then subsequently the downstream manifestations of disease. So we'll talk now about this concept of what it might mean to think a little bit differently about how we approach uh, such a disease classification. So on the left-hand side, you've got some of the clinical insults that we frequently face, and then on the far right-hand side, the clinical syndrome that has been assigned to uh, those. And so there's a concept that there's an inciting insult or inciting etiology, and then there's a downstream clinical manifestation that we sort of get at the bedside. But what I try to show in this middle panel is that there's actually quite a bit of diversity in the mechanistic mediators that actually lead to uh, those potential, um, that lead to those clinical manifestations. And so in the talk, we'll, we'll mention the bottom three things. I'll, I'll take for granted, and you'll have to take my word, that it's this concept that these host response pathways are actually what uh, are misaligned or excessive in some cases, and are actually what causes harm to the host and what actually sort of mediates bad outcomes. Um, but what we will talk a little bit about is the concept that these host responses do vary quite a bit from patient to patient. Um, and so although the clinical outcomes may appear similar, at the end of the day, the pathways that led there vary quite a bit. We'll also talk about the concept that these may be conserved and that they, in fact, may even be genetically determined. And finally, we'll talk about the concept that similar host responses may actually unfold across multiple critical illness states. So to start out, we'll focus a little bit on the variety that we see in some of the critical illnesses that we take care of. So these are data, genomic expression data from patients with sepsis. And the concept was that a lot of the anti-inflammatory and targeted immunotherapy that's been deployed in sepsis and clinical trials has led to neutral, neutral results. So these investigators took a number of about 250 patients with sepsis and performed leukocyte transcriptomics. They then did simple hierarchical clustering, which is sort of our off-the-shelf, um, unsupervised clustering method. And as you can see, they're able to define two different groups. They call these endotypes, or on the right-hand side, sepsis response signatures. They then go on to show that um, one of the two signatures, sepsis response signature one, actually was in fact characterized by a state of immune paralysis or immunosuppression with features of endotoxin tolerance, T cell exhaustion, and HLA downregulation. 
this actually was common. It was about 41% of the patients. So it wasn't sort of a small subgroup of people. It was a lot of people. 14-day uh, mortality in that group was higher. There were no clinical predictors such as age or sex or um, duration of critical illness, et cetera, that led you to conclude, that could have told you which response the patient would have. And what I think is potentially very interesting from a discovery perspective is that if you looked at the genes that were most differentially expressed between those two endotypes, none of them currently have a role as either targets or markers in therapy um, for sepsis. So the concept that you could sort of use such endotyping for biologic discovery, maybe even find the trigger points to move someone from one unfavorable endotype to the other emerges. But at the very least, you can appreciate the concept that the, I'm not exaggerating, the 16 trials, for example, of TNF-alpha inhibition in patients with sepsis applied to unselected populations would not have led to any significant improvement because on average it looks like a neutral result, but in half the patients they might get better, half the patients might actually get worse if you further immunosuppress them. Uh, and so really it becomes clear that you might, we might need to dig a little bit deeper than just these syndromic definitions and actually focus a bit on molecular classification. So one of the other questions that comes up is whether or not these are conserved endotypes or whether this is just something that is sort of situational. These are Danish adoption study data, um, a couple of years old, but I think there's a lot of fidelity in the method that suggests that if you had a biologic parent who died of infection at any age, you were fivefold you had a five-fold higher likelihood of dying from infection yourself than if you had an adoptive parent, suggesting a very, very high, <clears throat> excuse me, degree of heritability for the, for the risk of death from infection, although the infection itself might be more environmental, whether you survive it or not is highly heritable, potentially. But as a kind of control for these analyses, we can see for more familiar content for vascular causes, if you had a biologic parent who died before the age of 50, when we think of as the family history, the complex trait genetics-based um, uh, approach to sort of thinking about genetic risk of death and, and coronary disease. We see that there is a high risk of death, but if you kind of move out to older populations, and of course if you move to the adoptive um, parents, there doesn't seem to be as much of a significant association. Um, if you take leukocytes of patients with different ethnicities and you stratify them based on their ethnicity, you could show that if you give bacterial toxins and bacteria that are endemic to where that ethnicity was from, that patients have differential rates of clearing those infections. In other words, we've really sort of evolved in such close symbiosis with a number of bacteria over millennia to have a very careful genetic architecture which tries to provide a calibrated response to the types of triggers that potentially would require our immune system to fight it off. So all that to say there really is a very strong uh, base, in my opinion, that there are genetic drivers of the host response to infection. And there may also be in other critical illnesses too, because a lot of the same immune architecture is called upon for both sort of damage-associated molecular patterns as we think about in cardiogenic shock and MI and in trauma, and also the pathogen-associated molecular patterns that characterize sepsis. So another condition, this is moving us somewhere in the middle now, this is acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is a heterogeneous inflammatory lung disease. This is a secondary analysis of a trial that applied simvastatin, given its anti-inflammatory effects to patients with ARDS, and showed that if you looked at the whole trial, of course, there was no benefit. But if you did an agnostic clustering approach called latent class analysis that stratified the patients into, again, this is unsupervised clusters, you could show that biologically one group had a very hyperinflammatory subphenotype, whereas the other had a hypoinflammatory phenotype. You could see that survival was different. The hyperinflammatory group generally had a worse prognosis. But very interesting, the response to therapy was significant in the sense that the people who had the hyperinflammatory phenotype benefited from simvastatin, again, the mechanism of action being that it is anti-inflammatory. So you can imagine that sort of using these agnostic clustering methods, we might actually be able to sort of define some endotypes of host response that could predict outcome and predict individualized prognosis, but also allow us to target therapy appropriately. These are our analyses of 111 patients with STEMI. We applied the same clustering method that was used, just a very off-the-shelf approach. You can see two different clusters sort of emerge with, uh, on the top is uh, the patients, and on the left-hand side are um, about 13,000 transcripts. And you can see that there are significant differences in how the expression profiles of these two clusters emerge. Um, and if, what I think is very interesting is if you then look at the genes that are most differentially expressed between those two clusters, 
if you just sort of arbitrarily pick the top 10 on each side, you can see that on the right-hand side that one cluster has a very sort of predominant inflammatory phenotype with interleukin-1 beta emerging, several of the HLAs, EGRs, which are growth factors regulating a number of um, inflammatory cytokines. By contrast, on the other side, there are a number of sort of more platelet activation-related pathways, platelet factor 4, several of the integrins emerge. And you really sort of get the sense that perhaps there are some endotypes within patients that have STEMI that might be pro-inflammatory, might be more inflammatory at least. Others may have more sort of features of uh, thrombosis platelet um, activation. So uh, the red patients now are the, our control people. These are people with stable coronary disease. The green patients are one endotype, and the blue are the un other endotype, both of STEMI. And on the top, we've got, excuse me, three inflammatory transcripts, interleukin-1 betas in the middle. You can sort of see that there are, in some cases, even a bimodal distribution, but in other cases, at least sort of the concept that one group has more of a muted immune response, inflammatory response, the other group has a more robust inflammatory response. What I think is interesting is even when you look at the platelet pathways at the bottom, in fact, actually some people in the context of STEMI have downregulation of a lot of platelet activation pathways, uh, and that might sort of have implications further for how we target antithrombotic therapies and balance bleeding risk, obviously, post-ACS. But back to inflammation, it's obviously been an elusive target in MI. We know that inflammation is associated with incident heart failure as well as recurrent MI and all-cause mortality post-MI, and it's been an elusive target in the sense that efforts to target interleukin-1-beta even specifically have not borne out to prevent heart failure in clinical trials um, as well as in even animal studies. It seems that there's just too much heterogeneity that's not quite appreciated. And it may be in the same sense that TNF-alpha inhibition and sepsis failed to yield results in unselected populations that we need to focus our lens a little bit more carefully on the population of patients that may be particular risk um, because of a, a more robust inflammatory response. One question that comes up, obviously, when we think about MI is perhaps this is all just a reflection of your infarct size, and maybe people that have bigger heart attacks are just more likely to have a more uh, broad or large activation of some of these damage-associated molecular patterns. So if you look, though, historically through the literature, you can really get at this concept of whether the inflammatory response after MI is more a function of the host or is it more a function of the insult. And so we can look, for example, at correlations between peak troponin, CK, high sensitivity troponin, all of which you can see are at most modest and, and in many cases weak, suggesting that the CRP, or excuse me, the C-reactive protein, uh, which is a nonspecific marker of inflammation, really rises and falls almost independently of infarct size. What I think is also interesting from a prognostic perspective and therapeutic perspective is that if you then say, can we put both the peak troponin and the peak CRP into risk prediction models, you can actually show that they're independent predictors and that they have added a value, suggesting that it may not just be a measure of infarct size, it might actually be something innate to the host, and that furthermore, it might be something that is actually associated with worse outcomes and potentially a target for therapy. So it all kind of brings us to the last point, which is this concept that, you know, as I mentioned, there really is a, you know, I think we've evolved very, um, you know, to sort of have a very parsimonious immune architecture, which draws on conserved features to respond to both damage and pathogen-related molecular patterns. Uh, and in so doing, you might actually say, well, if, if some of the downstream pathways all kind of converge, it may in fact be that the same patient even would share similar features of that conserved host response if they were exposed to both trauma, heart attack, and, and then as maybe even sepsis. So we've tried to sort of uh, draw our inspiration from the concept in oncology that there is this shift towards more of a molecular disease taxonomy as advocated by the Institutes of Medicine. Um, and you've got these two concepts of oncology trials on the right-hand side, umbrella trials, where you say, well, it's clinically one disease, but there's subtypes, like we've highlighted, that may respond differently to different therapies. And maybe we need to actually break apart the molecular mechanisms a little bit more carefully so that we can align therapies. By contrast, you can actually, and I should say, sorry, this is that concept of sort of endotypes. By contrast, you've got the concept of a basket trial, which builds on the concept of an exotype, where you say, well, even though these diseases are clinically very different, they all have one common druggable pathway that sort of defines um, or sort of the linchpin to the clinical manifestations, and maybe we could actually sort of recycle some of our therapies across those different approaches. So in cancer, for example, where you, so you may initially say that Cancer has an anatomic location, such as skin cancer. It has a histologic subtype, like melanoma, and a histologic subtype, like superficial spreading or lentigo maligna or anything else. You then could sort of move into the more contemporary era and say, well, it has a BRAF B600E mutation, which is the genetic driver that is causally linked to that clinical manifestation of disease. 
And in oncology, they've now been doing basket trials where you take a bunch of people with diverse cancers, such as colorectal cancer, Burkitt's, a number of other diseases, and apply BRAF E600E inhibition uh, and potentially suggest that there's a benefit across broad populations, this that concept of a basket trial. So could we even think about doing basket trials in critical care, making use of the fact that some of this host response, or in other words, some of the genetic and you know, molecular drivers of disease are conserved? So I'd sort of draw the, bring us back to this figure and draw on that concept that there are really, on the right-hand side, there's an insult, excuse me, and then there's a downstream clinical manifestation and lots of host response stuff. And I would sort of say that the old approach has been to sort of target therapies on the far right-hand side based on the syndrome. A proposed new approach might be to say, well, since we're trying to use targeted molecular therapies, we should be profiling patients more um, based on molecular drivers of disease. In cancer, this paradigm has worked. The old paradigm is surgery, systemic chemotherapy, radiotherapy. But the new paradigm, obviously, is targeted um, oncogenic driver mutation therapy. Again, completely dependent on what the particular mutation is driving that disease. And that's something innate to the individual that needs to be quantified. So as sort of pilot data, we've looked at a number of patients with STEMI, with sepsis, and then with trauma. And we've seen these are now differential, a number of differentially expressed genes in these conditions relative to control, matched control conditions. And you can see, in fact, that a lot of the genetic expression actually overlaps across all of the three conditions, suggesting, again, that there may be some conserved um, architecture of how the body responds to multiple types of stresses. If we then take that same volcano plot that we saw earlier and we just sort of flip it on its side and kind of merge it, if we wanted to figure out how much overlap there was between two endotypes, we could basically plot the log fold change between the two endotypes on one axis and the log fold change between the two endotypes and another disease on the other axis. And if they're sort of following the pattern that's shown here, then they should be well correlated. So for example, this is the log fold change between two agnostically defined endotypes in community acquired pneumonia. Uh, and then in fecal peritonitis, a source of um, bacterial infection from the intestines. And you can see that they've got a very high correlation. So it really suggests that those endotypes are conserved, irrespective, in this case, of the source of infection. We saw that, at least from myocardial infarction and trauma, there actually is a very high correlation. As an epidemiologist, I think 0.67 is terrific. Um, and so there's a high correlation, in fact, between how the body responds in MI and how the body responds in trauma, potentially. We see less of a correlation between sepsis and those other conditions. And part of the reason that that's the case, is these data were all drawn from admission blood samples. We know, though, obviously, that when people have a heart attack, we, the goal is obviously within 60 minutes or so to get the patient to the hospital, get the blood vessel opened up. It's a very quick process. The same is true for major trauma, obviously, where the patient's brought to medical attention, hopefully quickly. But in infection and sepsis, it often sort of brews at home for a couple of days. And so as is shown in this picture, this is, again, C-reactive protein, people with septic shock, the solid squares generally presented with higher levels of CRP that then eventually sort of tapered off. By contrast, in STEMI and in cardiogenic shock, those levels really started out at the beginning fairly low and then went up. So it, it does suggest that we in our studies may need to think a little bit about timing of these, um, of these quantifications and where people are in their kind of disease trajectory. So how do we standardize this insult? Well, we're doing studies now taking patients undergoing cardiac surgery, using this as sort of a major um, sort of traumatic stress or at least um, non-infectious pro-inflammatory stimulus. And then we're preoperatively modeling how they would respond to bacterial exposures by doing LPS or bacterial endotoxin stimulation and looking at features of how the white blood cells um, genomic expression sort of unfolds. With the idea that if you take the same patient, expose them to two different diseases, if everything I've said is true, there should be variability in how people respond to the diseases across the conditions, but then there should be conservation in how I respond to the condition that's carried forward irrespective of how you, um, how you sort of activate the those patterns in me. So the last slide, I think I would sort of pitch this concept that the current syndromic definition of how we think about critical illness has really sort of failed to allow us to effectively deliver immunotherapies. I think that's particularly true in sepsis and ARDS, for example, where our therapies that have worked have all been things like fluid strategies, ventilator things, are all things that are innate in the current clinical definition, but when we've used molecular therapies, nothing's worked. Um, and it would sort of move us to more of a host response paradigm where we say, as we do in oncology, what are the actual disease drivers? If they're conserved, we can predict them. That might allow us to sort of have an individualized prediction. So for example, to take someone that has infection and decide if they need to be sent home from the emergency department or if they need to be admitted because they have a high risk of sepsis. That could also tell us who with the myocardial infarctions at high risk of heart failure after their event. 
And it obviously eventually one day could hopefully allow us to target therapies, picking the individuals that have the specific pathways that might potentially benefit from some of the targeted approaches that we have available. Thanks.